thank you all for arranging such beautiful weather here in St. Petersburg. Um, when I left London, it was raining, so coming here has been a real pleasure. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm relieved I didn't bring it to myself. So, um, yes, we had a beautiful day yesterday at the palace, so I wanted to uh, thank uh, the organizers for arranging to allow us to go and see your beautiful summer palace um, outside the city. Um, how are we doing, team? Yep, that's it. That's it, fantastic. So that's just a view of where we were yesterday with that fantastic weather. So germ cell tumors, where are they located? Well, the commonest place for them is in the gonads. Um, and in fact, testicular germ cell tumors are much, much more common than ovarian germ cell tumors, which likely reflects the fact that the germ cells are dividing throughout life in men, uh, whereas in women, they stop very early on, having made the required number of eggs. So there are, of course, extragonadal germ cell tumors. During development, the germ cells are laid all the way down the midline of the body, and so it's possible to have a germ cell tumor arising in the midline of the brain, in the uh, pituitary or pineal gland, for example, through the mediastinum in the chest, down into the retroperitoneal area in the abdomen, and into the presacral area. And occasionally, you even find uterine primary germ cell tumors. So um, the management of these germ cell tumors will vary according to the pathological subtype, the location, and age of the patient. Um, seminomas um, in boys, um, in girls, the equivalent of this is dysgerminomas. And pathologists, uh, if there's any pathologist in the audience, I'd like to apologize in advance. But pathologists like to confuse us, and they give the same tumor, different names, whether it arises in the testis, the ovary, or even in the brain. So a, a, a seminoma in the brain is called a germinoma, uh, but it's exactly the same tumor. But these tumors differ from the non-seminomatous or non-disgerminomatous type of tumor, and their management also differs. Um, the overall outcome is much best in the gonads. Um, and worst if it arises in the mediastinum. Um, brain germ cell tumors need uh, adapted management, so it's not the same as management elsewhere in the body. Pediatric germ cell tumors, so this is in the prepubertal population, their uh, medical management differs from that in adults. Uh, and that's possibly because the biology of the disease is a bit different. It's a much more aggressive tumor, much faster growing. Um, so rather than try and cover all of this today, I'm going to focus just on the ovarian germ cell tumors because I know that's what Elena is particularly interested in. So, and we're going to focus on this in post-pubertal um, um, uh, adults. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so the spectrum of uh, disease, um, uh, this also sometimes upsets pathologists because I view this from a clinical point of view rather than necessarily from a pathological point of view. But I like to think of the disease as either pre-malignant or malignant. Um, many people think that dermoids, or the same thing as a teratoma in uh, a boy, um, are uh, benign conditions. I prefer not to think of them as benign because uh, dermoids can continue to grow and they can also de-differentiate into many different types of nasty cancer, including squamous carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, um, bowel type tumors. So um, best not to think that a dermoid is benign. So I think of them as pre-malignant. And uh, inside dermoids, it may not all be mature tissue. Sometimes you can find immature tissues. And usually these are grade one, but occasionally they may be of higher grade. Um, and there are also things called monodermal teratomas, where it's just one type of feature that's present and not all the different tissue types. So under the malignant end of the spectrum, I like to think of them as dysgerminomas or 
the non-dis germinators of germ cell tumours, which includes the anaplastic germ cell tumours with a variety of different subtypes, and also these immature uh, germ cell tumours, which um, the most obviously malignant are the grade three. Grade two sits on the borderline between being malignant and not malignant. And some grade twos you'll see behaving in a very uh, malignant fashion and others really behaving much more in a benign fashion or pre-malignant way. And then of course it's possible to get mixtures of these different types of tumors present. Um, and it's as well to think that you can move from one end of the spectrum to the other. So when you treat these malignant forms of germ cell tumors, you sometimes destroy all the active cancer, but then you're left with mature bits of tissue which can then uh, continue to grow, but they would be classified as dermoids when you take them out, or teratomas. Um, and of course, it's possible for the dermoid or teratoma that's left after treatment to grow or de-differentiate back into active cancer. So it's a moving feast between the malignant and pre-malignant ends of the spectrum. So what things are, do we know about germ cell tumors broadly, the ovarian germ cell tumors? So peak age is between 15 to 25 years, but any age is possible. Uh, incidence, we estimate, is about one in half a million, so really rare stuff. Uh, it's about 2 to 3% of all ovarian tumors. It seems to be a bit more common in the black and Hispanic populations compared to others, but how solid that data is remains to be seen. Uh, there are possible genetic links. So I, in my clinic, have one family uh, with um, a, a repetitive dermoids affecting several family members. Um, and there are one or two other reports of this in the literature. The underlying gene for this has not yet been found. Uh, if we collect the families, maybe we'll be able to isolate the genetic cause, rather like we've been able to do in molar pregnancies. For yolk sac tumors, uh, there's been some recent data published associating them with um, PI3 kinase uh, mutations and uh, protein kinase B or AKT1 mutations and KRAS. Um, and for growing teratoma syndrome, there's been a report out this year showing that in one case, in a child, there was a P10 mutation. So clearly we have a lot to learn about how these germ cell tumors arise and what predisposes to them. Um, obviously gonadal dysgenesis is another link to getting ovarian germ cell tumors. So both Turner's and Swire's are associated syndromes for gonadal dysgenesis and have increased risk of developing the disease. These patients present quite differently from epithelial ovarian cancer. So they typically have a very short history of a rapidly enlarging abdomen. Uh, sometimes patients think they've got pregnant, and indeed they can sometimes have a positive pregnancy test. Uh, because of this mass coming out of the pelvis, they may present with obstructive symptoms. Um, the rapid growth may lead also to bleeding into the abdomen and acute abdomen. Uh, you can get torsion of the ovary because of uh, the, the lump causing the ovary to tort more easily. Um, the HCG, if it's elevated, may suppress the menstrual cycle and cause breast tenderness. Uh, the dysgerminomas may rarely secrete uh, PTH, parathyroid hormone-related hormone peptide, and that can cause um, hypercalcemia rarely and its associated symptoms. And of course, it can present with metastatic features of disease. So if it's in the lungs, they might be breathless. If it's in the brain, they may fit, present with fits. Uh, or systemic features of just generally feeling ill, malaise, uh, fevers. So a variety of different presentations, but typically it's a rapidly growing mask arising out of the pelvis. Um, how do you investigate this? Well, obviously the simplest investigation is an ultrasound, which may well show a complex cystic mass coming out of the pelvis. Um, this in any young person should prompt more uh, um, open investigation, including a contrast enhanced uh, CT of the body, uh, if you have access to it, MRI pelvis, I find, is better than CT in the pelvis. Um, tumor markers, so uh, 
should always be thought of because, of course, this might give you the diagnosis. You might not need to go any further once you've found that the patient has both an elevated HCG and AFP and a, a complex pelvic mass. What else is this tumor likely to be other than an ovarian germ cell tumor in a young patient? CA125 is not a um, specific marker. Anything that causes peritoneal inflammation will cause the CA125 to go up. LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, is also not a specific marker, but can correlate with uh, how the disease is behaving in response to treatment and can give you a clue that you might be dealing with an ovarian germ cell tumor. So if there are lung metastases, then this increases your risk of having brain disease. So a MRI of the brain uh, is worth uh, considering. Um, what about PET scanning? Lots of people think that PET scanning is a great idea. Uh, we personally find it not terribly helpful. Uh, it causes false positives, false negatives, and in the initial investigations, it's not part of our routine. Um, bone involvement with germ cell tumors can occur, but it's exceptionally rare, which would be, I suppose, another reason for wanting to do an FDG PET as this lights up the bones very well. Genetics, if you have somebody whose diagnosis comes back as a choriocarcinoma, then you need to think, is this a germ cell derived choriocarcinoma or is this a gestational choriocarcinoma? And it's possible to do microsatellite polymorphism analysis to sort this out as uh, if it's a gestational pregnancy uh, causing this a, a gestational choreo, then you will find it has paternal genes. It's not just the patient's DNA present. So stage one disease, how should this be managed? Well, typically fertility conserving uh, treatment is what you want. Remember, these are young people. So a unilateral salpingoephrectomy is the way to go. Um, it does need some staging to look to see whether it's spread elsewhere. So a good view of the rest of the abdomen, biopsy of the omentum. Do you need to biopsy the contralateral ovary? No. Rather like in testis cancer, we've learned that this is not necessary in ovarian germ cell tumors. And it might actually cause scarring of the remaining ovary, which uh, could uh, lead to impaired fertility. So we no longer do this. Uh, do you need to do extensive lymph node dissection? There are some that still argue that you should. We would argue very strongly that it is completely unnecessary, just like the case in testicular germ cell tumors where this is no longer done. This disease is very sensitive to chemotherapy, so unless you have an obviously enlarged lymph node, no point removing it. Uh, so peritoneal washings, however, are useful, paracolic uh, washings, so that you've um, uh, got uh, some idea as to whether or not this is seeded outside the ovary. Uh, so how should this operation be done? Should you do it by an open procedure or because this is a young woman who doesn't want a big scar, should you do it by a laparoscopic approach? Um, I personally favor the, the open approach because it's easier um, to get a good view and to remove the whole ovary intact. Um, and if you have a large tumor, you're going to have to morselate this inside the abdomen before you can take it out through a small porthole. And the problem of morselation is it destroys the pathologist's ability to tell you whether the tumor had broken through the capsule. You've got no idea, so you can't work out whether this is a, a stage 1A or a stage 1C. Uh, and of course, it could potentially seed the tumor and convert the patient into a stage 1C. Um, in theory, there may be port site metastases, although I've never seen this in this disease. Um, and as we said earlier, it can ruin the ability of the pathologist to properly stage the patient for you. So I prefer the open procedure, although I understand that many young women would not like to have a, a larger scar. So how could you manage a stage 1A patient who you think is stage 1A from your operation and uh, from uh, the pathology that's come back? Uh, well, one way is to consider surveillance. Um, another option might be to give them adjuvant chemotherapy, something that is uh, done. Uh, both of these strategies are used in male germ cell tumors. 
Um, you could, if you had a dysgerminoma, think about giving adjuvant radiotherapy, but actually that's now uh, past tense because there's ample data showing that radiotherapy induces sterility and uh, that it can cause second cancers. So that's no longer an option. Uh, you might think about doing additional surgery to remove other things that uh, you originally thought were not uh, positive but could be positive. Uh, but again, that's no longer really an option uh, because of the morbidity associated with it. So um, would poor prognostic features dampen your enthusiasm for doing surveillance? Uh, so things like lymphovascular invasion might be considered a poor prognostic feature. If you've got marker-positive disease, some people say that's a poor prognostic feature. Very large tumors, uh, endothermal sinus or yolk sac tumor are frequently quoted in the literature as poor prognostic features. Uh, pure choriocarcinoma is also thought to be a poor prognostic feature. But in fact, with all of these things, surveillance looks like it's probably still okay. Um, it certainly is in the male testicular germ cell tumors. In the women, we're still learning because we still only have smaller numbers of patients. Uh, so this just illustrates a lady who had a 24 centimeter stage 1A germ cell tumor. It was a yolk sac tumor, AFP secreting. You can see the green line is falling very nicely. Uh, and it returns to a normal value. And you'll see that the blue line, which is the HCG, some months after the removal of the uh, ovary has gone up. So her HCG has risen. Hands up, how many people here think that she's relapsed? Nobody thinks she's relapsed. That's good because she hadn't. That was the result. So very happy result. Uh, so here's another lady uh, having, I think, a 26 centimeter yolk sac tumor removed. And you'll see her AFP was initially falling reasonably well according to its half-life, but the rate of fall started to peter out towards the end. And indeed, you can start to see the AFP beginning to rise. Uh, so she had a marker relapse. Investigations were completely negative at this point, And she went on and had three cycles of BEP chemotherapy. Uh, so uh, after that, you'll see that her AFP, the, the bottom line, returns to normal. But you'll notice that the top line, the HCG, has blipped up a little bit. And that's quite common because when we give uh, intensive chemotherapy, we induce a temporary menopausal state. Um, fortunately, the ovaries recover within a few months of finishing the treatment, and that's without having to do anything special. You don't necessarily need to use GNHRH analogs. Uh, it's perfectly okay just to allow this to happen naturally. Uh, and you'll then notice that a few months later, the HCG has gone up, and she was also pregnant. So whether you have chemotherapy or you don't have chemotherapy and you have only one ovary left, it is perfectly positive, uh, possible to get pregnant. And our latest data, which we're just analyzing, comparing this shows that the success rate in getting pregnant after chemotherapy or without chemotherapy in these women is the same. It's about 83%. So stage 1A, adjuvant versus surveillance. There's no completely right answer which you should do. Uh, we uh, note that the costs are very similar in our health uh, economy. Maybe in yours it will be a bit different, but for us it's very similar. Surveillance is clearly the least toxic thing to do. If the patient can't comply, we give uh, carboplatin AUC 7 times 2 for the dysgerminomatous uh, germ cell tumors. And for the non-dysgerminomatous, unlike the male testicular disease, where you might only give one cycle of BEP, we give three cycles of BEP. And you may be saying, why do we do so much? And the answer is that the early data we have suggests that germ cell tumors in the ovary respond best with the first lot of chemotherapy. If they relapse after chemotherapy, they do very badly, unlike the male testicular germ cell tumors, for reasons that we don't yet understand. Long-term monitoring is clearly required with both. 
So when is it safe to get pregnant? Well, the latest relapse in our series is 24 months. In the Vicus series, it was 19 months. And you'll see occasional case reports where it may be a bit more than 24 months. So our advice for young women is to wait 24 months. For those women who are a bit more mature and are keen to get on with having pregnancies, we tell them what the data is and then it's up to them when they want to get pregnant. And you'll notice that a couple of those patients I showed you were getting pregnant about a year after their uh, initial treatment. So summary for stage 1A, fertility conserving surgery is the way to go. Surveillance is a reasonable option. Uh, the actual data, are, the latest data from our set, at centre is 19% relapse rate. Uh, some reports go up to 36% relapse rate, but nearly all of these women can expect to be cured. Um, adjuvant therapy uh, is an alternative. Uh, we use this in non-compliant patients for surveillance, uh, but remember it's going to overtreat at least 75% of women who never needed any chemotherapy. Um, there are, of course, short and long-term toxicities of the chemo, and most of the relapses occur within one to two years, and nearly all of those are in the pelvis or the abdomen, so that's where your imaging effort needs to go. Fertility is very high in these women, but not if you irradiate their pelvis. So can we extend surveillance to stage 1C? Uh, so stage 1C immature germ cell tumors, um, uh, probably surveillance is safe if they've got a uh, grade one or grade two. What about grade three, the most obviously malignant type of immature germ cell tumor? There's some data coming from the Italians, the MITO group, that suggests that it may be safe to do surveillance in these women, and we have a joint publication that we're working on where we've combined our data with the MITO data, and it is an option, and we've certainly been offering it as an option for some patients who want it, but we've had one grade three lady who relapsed on surveillance with a periotic node. She went through chemotherapy. The node grew again. We took it out. Uh, it was still containing active cancer, so she went on to require two rounds of high-dose chemotherapy in order to achieve a remission. And, of course, she's now infertile as a consequence of high-dose chemotherapy, although she's well. What about dysgerminomas? Can you do stage 1C surveillance for those patients? Possibly is the answer. Uh, so something that we're now actively exploring. What about for non dysgerminomatous uh, 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 patients that are not uh, uh, grade 3? Uh, well, I think the answer to that is probably not safe to do surveillance in these patients, so we don't currently offer that to them. So not, not to a stage 1C yolk sac tumor or, for example, a stage 1C choreo. Surgery for more advanced disease. Um, do we actually need to do debulking diagnostic surgery in a patient who's got obvious metastatic disease when you image them? Well, if they're marker positive, you've got the diagnosis. So do you really need to do anything? Probably not. You could probably get on and give them chemotherapy. If they're marker negative, then you certainly need to get some tissue out to make the diagnosis. Um, Urgent neoadjuvant chemotherapy is something to consider. Why? Well, it may preserve fertility because if you've got a really big complex mass in the abdomen, you come to operate, you may end up taking both ovaries, tubes, and the uterus out because it's also stuck down. Give the chemotherapy, you might shrink this down and make the surgery much easier later on. And um, if you do massive radical debulking surgery in these patients, uh, you may find that in the post-operative period, while they're healing up and they're not well enough to give chemotherapy, all the tumor regrows. So any benefit that you had out of the debulking is lost. So we think that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is well worth considering in these very advanced cases. This just shows you a patient who had quite advanced disease in the pelvis, went through chemotherapy, and it all melted away. Here's another lady with very advanced disease. You can see peritoneal studding um, and ascites, and you'll notice that after chemotherapy, all of this has gone away. So then all you need to do is remove the affected ovary. 
Uh, here's an example where the advanced disease got a bit smaller and calcified with chemotherapy, and these residual masses need to be removed because you don't know whether it's got active cancer or dead teratoma or whatever, so you have to take it out. And post-surgery, the, the response is, as you can see on the right-hand side, great. So here's a patient who was treated in another center, and they carried on treating this woman for a year with various different chemotherapy regimens, and all through the year, the disease just kept growing. What the center didn't realize is that she had mature teratoma growing syndrome, and so she was unnecessarily getting more and more chemotherapy. Her markers had been initially raised. They'd largely normalized. Her AFP remained a bit raised, and that's because the liver was being damaged by chemotherapy and was producing AFP as it was trying to repair itself. So what did she need? She needed an operation, and you can see the post-chemo um, pre-operation and then the post-surgical appearance on the right. This is the disease below the diaphragm, so very extensive. So we had to assemble a chest a surgeon, a liver surgeon, and a gynae oncology surgeon all working together to achieve this. So you need surgical teams working together with a large experience when managing this disease, and she's now very well. So, what chemotherapy should we give for people with more advanced disease? Well, for early stage advanced disease, it's a complete no-brainer. Uh, BEP chemotherapy, three cycles would be the normal standard of care. Some people might add a fourth cycle if the marker response has been slow. Uh, for stage three and four, again, most centers would be using BEP, but before you get to use BEP, if you've got really advanced disease, you probably ought to think about using some lower dose induction chemotherapy to avoid killing the patient from a metabolic upset with very rapid tumor collapse on standard doses of chemotherapy. So this is what we use to try and avoid this uh, metabolic problem um, and after one or two cycles of this, it's given every week, this treatment, and one or two rounds of this, they then go on to the standard of care chemotherapy. Uh, so what might that be? Well, for most people, it would be f at least four cycles of BEP. Uh, in our center, we've been piloting a seven-drug regimen for some years on the basis that we don't think BEP is good enough. And I have to tell you that I don't think either POMACE or BEP is actually good enough. Uh, we need something better. We need to better understand how to isolate the very poor risk stage four patients from the other patients. So I'll show you some data for that in a moment. So how long should you carry on the therapy? Many people just give four cycles of BEP and stop. Well, that may well not be enough because the markers haven't yet normalized in some of those patients. So you probably need to keep going until the markers have been normal for at least four weeks. Obviously, with alpha-feta protein, that can be a problem because it may never normalize because of the liver damage from chemo. Uh, whereas for HCG, at least, you've got a more clear signal. Um, we know that the relapses do very badly in the women. This is completely different from the men after chemotherapy, but we don't understand why they do badly. So this just shows you some old data. You'll see that the stage 1 CMs have 100% survival, uh, and that's still true today on our latest analysis. Uh, the stage 4 patients you'll see do extremely badly. Uh, so 65% of these achieving long-term overall survival. Uh, so that's clearly not good enough. We've increased this on our latest analysis up to 75% overall survival at 10 years. But again, I don't view that as good enough. We've got a long way to go. So I don't think either POMACE or BEP are going to be uh, the right solution here. We need some additional treatments. So what might you try? Well, could you isolate the poor risk stage fours who are going to relapse and give them more intensive chemotherapy. Well, if you could, high-dose chemotherapy is what is used in men. Um, and you'll see from this uh, series from Einhorn's group in the States where they had 13 women who relapsed, they managed to get four of those 13 into remission with a tandem high-dose procedure. So it's only a 30% salvage rate, much lower than what you expect in male disease. 
So we need something more. What about immunotherapy? Well, we've been piloting this in our center and others have been doing it around the world. And I'm afraid the signal here for immunotherapy in male or female germ cell tumors is, is it's useless, really. Uh, you get very transient responses occasionally. I have had no patient go into a complete remission. So how are we going to improve? I think we need centralized care. Uh, we need to, this will eliminate case selection bias, it enables centralized pathology review, imaging and patient review, it enables larger studies to be done, uh, and uh, you can still share the care of these patients with your local center. So for us, we're now seeing 45 new cases a year, but most of the chemotherapy is being delivered in the local centers. Um, International databases would also be, I think, a useful step forwards. And there are various uh, uh, processes in place to try and do this in Europe. So in summary, uh, you may not need debulking surgery in more advanced disease. Uh, BEP chemotherapy, three to four cycles for earlier stage uh, advanced disease, but much more advanced disease needs at least four cycles of BEP or POMACE. And as you can see, the results still aren't really good enough. We need to improve. Um, you could consider high dose for poor risk patients, but you've got to think how you're going to identify them. Uh, just saying they're stage four doesn't really tell you which of the stage four are going to do badly. Um, we know the relapses in ovarian germ cell tumors do badly, but we of course need these new prognostic factors. Fertility post chemo fortunately appears to be very good, and that's without having to do anything extra. And centralized care would probably be the way to go. And in Europe, we have a, a Eurocan initiative which might help in this regard. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I'd like to acknowledge the fact that I work with a large team in the UK.